This is James Stewart, and he is going to present on the value of open source for digital transformation of gov.uk. Uh, James is CTO and partner of Public Digital. Thank you for being here, James. Thank you. Great to be here. And uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on, on where you are. Um, I'm in, in London in the UK, um, where it is mid-afternoon. Um, so I'm glad to just have coffee. Um, yeah, so as, uh, as Jen said, I'm a partner and CTO of Public Digital. Uh, we're a digital transformation consultancy. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Um, I was the co-founder of an organization called the Government Digital Service, uh, which uh, is, is kind of the core of what I'm going to be talking about today. And I was the Deputy Chief Technology Officer for the UK government. Um, I also spent some time, uh, as most people who end up deep in, in kind of public sector work do, um, working in, in cybersecurity. Um, and I have some advisory roles as well. Um, I see in, in organizations that are going through some sort of transformation, uh, as most are, um, and uh, usually those that are kind of old and or complex. Uh, so sort of governments, parliaments, uh, local councils, uh, but also big, long established uh, financial service and, and third sector organizations. Um, so as I said, Public Digital is a digital transformation consultancy. We're, we're based in London. Um, we work around the world, um, helping uh, large institutions that matter um, to embrace uh, what we call internet era ways of working. Um, so this is just a sort of sampling of our, our, our clients, um, mixed of sort of every sector um, we've worked in, um, and uh, usually organizations that have some sort of clear public purpose about what they do because our, our mission is to bring some of the world's biggest institutions into the internet era, um, improving millions of people's lives. Um, and we've been really privileged to, to get to do that with so many of those clients. Um, and and our, our approach kind of has two layers, um, as, as may or may not become apparent as I, I sort of go through the, the talk. Um, we, we place a big emphasis on the role of leaders uh, in enabling and, and driving digital transformation. Um, often that means helping leaders learn and embody some, some different behaviors, uh, set teams up to work in different ways. Um, but then we see the core of any transformation as being about how, how teams are set up to deliver and scale. Um, so we get quite close in to, to teams that have been asked to work in, in radically different ways for their organization and help them get their, their ways of working right, help make sure that governance is a place that's supportive to them. And, uh, Help, help them to show their organizations what those organizations are really capable of. Um, but we're best known, as I said, for the, the work of the UK Government Digital Service. Uh, that's uh, a unit that uh, sits at the center of the UK government, uh, was charged with, with driving digital transformation across, across the national government. Um, it was established uh, when there was a new government coming in, in, in 2010, who had recognized that the, the ways of delivering that the British government had adopted weren't working for it. Uh, in an era where everybody was starting to get used to high quality online services, government services usually lagged behind. They were expensive. Um, some measures said that the UK government was the most expensive government in the world to run from a technology point of view uh, per head of population. Uh, and for a government that was looking to to set itself out as being part of a, a new era, a new generation, and to save some money, that wasn't acceptable. Um, Francis Maud, who's the gentleman top left of my slide, uh, was government minister charged with uh, finding new efficiencies for government. And he commissioned Martha Lane Fox, who's pictured below him, who was an internet entrepreneur, um, now a member of the House of Lords, uh, Baroness Lane Fox of Soho, uh, as she's now styled, uh, to review some of government's uh, primarily their websites um, to, to look at what opportunities there were to provide better websites with better value for money. Martha did, did that review and came back and very clearly said that the opportunity is not just about better websites for government. It's about an approach that she called digital by default. It's about thinking about how would we develop and provide government services uh, if we were building them today with the expectations that come with the technologies, the ways of working, the customer service experience um, that we've become used to through the internet. 
And she laid out four steps that were needed to do that. The first was create a new team at the centre of government that could model a different way of working uh, and then had the levers to make change across the system. The next was to fix publishing, uh, to uh, stop the proliferation of government websites, which were organised around what initiatives do people want to show off about, uh, not how do we help people get to the information that meets their needs. Then to start looking at fixing the, the big transactional experiences people have of government. Um, in the UK nationally, that's things like your driving licence, it's paying your taxes, it's receiving social security benefits, um, those sorts of things. Um, and then to go wholesale, uh, which meant to sort of spread out in two directions. And one was, was build capability so that government as a whole gets better at working in a modern internet era way. Uh, the other was to open up APIs and data so that you have a, a whole new range of ways of, of collaborating with, with civil society, with the private sector, and others. And uh, governments commission many reports of this sort. Uh, the thing that made it different was that there was a very rapid, very enthusiastic response and very quickly a team set up to start doing the first two of those uh, steps in the mission. Uh, that's where I came in. This is a picture of me about 11 years ago when my hair was a darker colour. Um, uh, we, we built a team that was charged with demonstrating what in practice it would look like to deliver a new single government website, single domain for government as it was referred to, that was organised around the needs of citizens uh, rather than the structure of government. Uh, that team of 14 was a mix of so seven or eight of us who'd come in from outside government uh, with various design, technology and uh, delivery skills uh, alongside a number of uh, long-term civil servants who knew how the system worked but were anxious to, to change it. We, this is, this is roughly the breakdown of the team, we gathered in a sort of disused room in the corner of a government office. Uh, we were working in quite a, a scrappy, prototypey way uh, very, very collaborative. Um, but one of the really important things about that was that we were, we were charged not with designing a big program governance approach, uh, not with uh, conforming to a set of previous expectations, but instead, talk about how would you start tackling this problem if you were in a startup, if you were working uh, really from scratch, where you could just draw on all of the tools uh, and techniques that are available anywhere in the world um, and not the kind of standard bureaucratic trappings um, that go with it. Uh, so lots of sketching on the wall um, and lots of reaching for, for cloud services and for open source, which at the time were quite alien concepts uh, to government or certainly things people didn't talk about using, uh, even if they were using them. So over a course of about three months, uh, we built uh, what was called AlphaGov, uh, the alpha of gov.uk, an early test in public of what a single government website could look like. Uh, this was constructed from a, a sort of set of uh, open source tools and frameworks, which is what let us move quickly and collaboratively. Um, and it really demonstrated just how fast a small team that's using the tools that are available at this point in 2011, uh, have even more so now in, in 2022, um, can move in, in delivering things. And I very clearly remember the uh, culture shock on the faces of some of the sort of colleagues that were used to some of the older modes of delivery when uh, week on week we would do a showcase of what we'd developed and they'd see substantial changes. Uh, they'd see entire new features spun up in a matter of days, um, but crucially adapted based on feedback that we were getting from testing them with, with real users. Um, and our focus was to kind of try and find the top 100 needs that people had of government. Uh, so not to start with how do we present the information about the Ministry of Transport, um, but instead to, to draw on uh, data from search queries, data from analytics across the existing website estate, uh, and some primary research to say, what are the, the things that people are most commonly coming to government looking for help with? Uh, and like, there's very quickly a, a kind of long tail effect where you see there's a small number of things that people regularly want and lots of people access 
and a much smaller uh, volume of people looking for a, a far larger set of, of services. By doing this exercise, it let us kind of find the edges of the sorts of problems that we need to solve, um, but also find the things that we could meaningfully test with a large group of people very quickly to make sure that we were on track. And we're constantly bringing a perspective that was about how do people act online to how we were approaching that, which was, again, quite alien to the system we were in. Uh, you'd find the normal conversations would be about how do we make sure that the home page is right? And we had to keep saying, well, hardly anybody goes to the home page. Uh, I think these days about 9% of traffic to gov.uk starts at the home page, which at the scale it's operating at today is quite a lot of people. But back then in the early stages of it, um, so almost everybody is using search to get to your site. And if you're doing it right, they're never hitting the home page. They're going straight to the thing that they need answering. That's a simple thing to say, but culturally it, was, it had a huge impact on how people thought about describing what they were doing, putting an emphasis on the content uh, and moving away from, from the kind of complexity of the kind of information architecture and organizational architecture of government. Uh, so launched an alpha version in, in May. By January, we had what we called the beta version. This was the point where we started to say, you can actually rely on the information you're finding on this site but we are going to keep improving this in public and testing new aspects of it. And then by October of 2012, we switched off the two main government websites that had preceded this, redirected all of the traffic to gov.uk, and it was the official government website. That process, um, relatively quick, but took about £65 million pounds a year out of government spending, um, but more importantly, got... Um, fantastic feedback from people who could much more quickly find the services that they needed and get the information that they needed. Over the following couple of years, we, we went through a process of switching down, switching off uh, almost all of the other websites that UK government offered. So those were separate organisational websites, past campaigns, other things, and bringing all of that together onto gov.uk. It was a huge effort, um, but uh, what it meant was that we had see the cost efficiencies that came with that, the improved user satisfaction, just because the design and writing were much better. But we were also able to start saying, okay, what are the journeys that you get across this if you stop thinking in your organizational structure and start thinking about user needs? The government policy on something may be split between six different departments, but people just want one answer to what it is. Um, the services that are available to you in a certain journey in your life, like starting a business, maybe the responsibility of four different government departments, but people just want to know where to start and when they're finished with setting up that business. Lots of heavy lifting, lots of um, very complicated stakeholder conversations to get to this point, but the result was a significantly simpler and cheaper experience. Um, nearly 2,000 websites gone by 2014. And this is the sort of thing that it now looks like. Uh, so if you want to know about what the national minimum wage is and, and any kind of caveats on that, there's one very simple page written very much in the vernacular. So the content is heavily tested to make sure that it's, it's clear and simple for people to understand. And the same thing's true of most of the information about specific government organizations, because they do still need a home. Um, but they have a consistent appearance, consistent structure that's far better for transparency um, and takes a lot of the cost of trying to have separate things for each of them out of the way. So our strap line was simpler, clearer, faster for users and savings and efficiencies for governments. And uh, we were delighted to start winning some awards like the, the Design of the Year Award, which is the UK's most prestigious design award. First time it was ever given to a website. It was for gov.uk. That was, a, that was a sign that we were onto something with the simpler, clearer, and faster for users. Um, but that process and building that team was also the start of unlocking a much, much deeper set of changes across government. We'd shown what was possible when you build a small team that was empowered to use the technologies and working practices of the internet era. And that allowed us to start doing big contract reform, big capability reform, to the point where we were saving 
vast amounts of money on government's technology. So this is a blog post um, and we got some audited figures that in one year we saved 1.7 billion pounds. Over three years, that was 4.1 billion pounds. So quite a remarkable position to be in where you can deliver that level of savings um, while also delivering far better services for citizens. So I wanted to talk about kind of three things that we did uh, as part of that, that I think were, were very important for that success, um, but which are hopefully uh, useful building blocks for other people who might be on their own kind of transformation and journey. The first of those is that we, we worked almost entirely in the open. So when we launched that alpha version of gov.uk back in, in May 2011, we, we blogged about it, we talked about it, we uh, got out and engaged users and influencers and everybody we could in what we've been doing. But that was the start of a process where we shared very publicly every part of what we were learning. So um, these are two screenshots from our, our blog at the time. Um, one, uh, really importantly for the open source community, we talked about every single part of the stack that we'd used to build that alpha of gov.uk. We maintained that as we went into later stages. So where previously government had been making use of some open source tools, but kind of in denial about it or hidden within contracts so nobody was quite sure, we put that front and center. And that was a really important part of, of building it back pool of talent we could address because people saw these tools as things they wanted to work with too um, but also signaling that we were we were building on the work that others had done and we were going to contribute back um, the blog post on the right was my very first blog post on a government domain um, talk about a mistake we made um, how we got some of the geolocation features on that alpha wrong um, and had confused our users in the process uh, and that was a really important signal that we were going to not only um, allow for failure and adapt to it. We were going to talk about it so that others could learn and we could benefit from other people's advice. That process of talking publicly was immensely valuable um, for the, uh, the, the relationships it built for us, for the people it attracted to work with us, but also for the, uh, the impact it allowed us to have because we got a lot of positive feedback about that. So when Francis Maud went out to Silicon Valley to talk to people there about his technology plans for government, they'd already seen some of these blog posts and some of the coverage that we got. Uh, and we got some really sort of positive feedback from that, which then let him see this as a political win. Um, and, and starting out publicly allowed us to quite seamlessly transition to releasing back uh, a lot of the code that we were producing. So uh, I think we were the first bit of government to openly have a profile on, on GitHub. Uh, there's now a vast number of uh, repositories produced by the Government Digital Service. Most of those aren't supported as kind of big open source projects, but some are, and they're all there if people want to take them, um, learn from them, contribute back, or ask the team to make them more reusable. Um, so there's been a number of tools that have spun off because of this process that other teams have picked up. Some which are still supported by the government digital service, some which have been adopted elsewhere. And that spread. Um, so this is the I read your government.github.com that shows that, as I said, I think we were the first. Uh, and we did it without much ceremony. I just created an organization, started putting code there. Um, but many, many other public sector organizations around the world have now joined in. And there's a, there's a huge amount of collaboration that takes place. And that was important because the next thing that we did that uh, was vital for the deeper transformation we were trying to affect is that we made everything that we did very easy to copy. Now that, you know, putting code out there that people can take and use is part of that, though more it was talking about how we were working. Um, we actually went as far as to produce a, a manual um, that described how we thought about digital delivery and then eventually became embedded, embodied in a sort of standard um, about how teams across government needed to uh, think about and work on, on their delivery. Um, but we, we knew that to get the scale of change we were working on, we couldn't do it all ourselves. Um, but what we could do is, is show what was possible and then help other people to copy it. Uh, so that's what the service design manual did. That meant that there are now teams right across the UK government who work in a very different way, who are completely uh, free to 
to adopt open source tools that use cloud heavily, but also very focused on their, on their users. Um, and it was lifted and copied in, in many other places. Um, so uh, very quickly, we found that we were having conversations with some like-minded organizations like the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau in the, in the US, but also being asked to help with setting up the United States Digital Service, um, the Australian government, the Israeli government, the Uruguayan government, the Peruvian government have all lifted parts of this approach. And they were able to do that because we, we made what we did open and we made it easy to copy. Um, and because a lot of the building blocks from a technology point of view were just there through open source, through cloud, through other developments that we've had in recent years. And so you can see in some cases, people almost entirely lifted and shifted what we'd done um, and did actually reuse some of the code that we'd produced. So this is the homepage of the, the government of New Zealand from a few years ago, which other than some color changes uh, was exactly the same as gov.uk. And then the, the third thing that we did was that we recognized that the important thing for making progress here is to focus on, on teams over technology. Now, I'm a technologist and I, I love all of the things that I can do with tech and I love finding, finding new things or hearing about new things that people have done. But the thing that I find most exciting is that the, the technology developments in the last 15 or 20 years have really been um, in large part about commoditizing a lot of tech. And so where it used to be that anytime you were doing a big initiative, um, like delivering a service online, you had to invent huge parts of the stack that did that for yourself. And we've seen a, a, a wave come where so much of the, uh, the, the plumbing is just there and done for you whether that's in the form of cloud services that we can summon through APIs uh, that mean that we don't have to spend nearly so much time investing in, in upfront infrastructure design and, uh, and procurement, um, or if it's open source tools that let us much more quickly get the basics of any application up and running and some of those common building blocks in place and let us really focus on where the value is. And what that lets us do is start saying we don't need to have such siloed technology efforts that are building that core infrastructure, but instead we can build multidisciplinary teams that get close to their users um, and, and know that they can, they can learn from the users and iterate the technology quickly. The photo on the left is one from the Government Digital Service Office, um, which we were in from about 2012 to 2016, um, where we, we sort of constantly were emphasizing that the core focus of what we were doing was understanding what users needed and meeting those needs. Uh, so we stuck a piece of paper on, the, on one of the windows with the, the arrow saying users, and we showed that to everybody who came to visit us. Without the building blocks that we had from the, from the modern technologies, we wouldn't have been able to have that relentless focus on users. We would have been worried about how to make the, the basics of the technology and scale it. Um, but because those basics were already there for us, uh, for us to tap into, we could really focus on making sure we were getting things right for our users. And really, really invest in multidisciplinary teams who came together. So this is a team from the Peruvian government that we worked with. Um, and you can see, uh, whether you speak Spanish or not, you've got people who focus on, on the sort of understanding users, sitting with designers, sitting with engineers, sitting with uh, with, with um, people who focus on other aspects of communication, knowing that the technology to solve the problems they're trying to solve is there for them to pull on. Uh, won't necessarily be easy to scale, but they can, they can pull on it and they can start thinking about how to use it together with a, with a rapid feedback loop to understand if it's working for the people it needs to work for. And that's something that we tried to institutionalize in, in a change to the project management methodology that came in, in UK government with our work, going from uh, a sort of fairly unsurprising waterfall method of, of work where we did a lot of policy formation, writing business cases, capturing requirements, a lot of time in procurement, much smaller amount of time actually building and, and testing uh, a thing that you wanted. But really, you only knew if it was going to be successful for users right at the end of the process. 
And because we were able to capture these developments in technology, build on the, on the shoulders of, of the, the giants who brought us a lot of the open source components that we were able to use, we could start by thinking about using needs up front. We could do small scale, rapid discoveries, prototypes and testing. And then we could work from there to scale the thing up. Uh, that's significantly reduced the number of uh, failures in government technology in the UK and in other jurisdictions where they've picked it up. And, and shifting that around has really come into its own uh, through the pandemic time where uh, the, there's been a need to respond very, very rapidly, but to do so through understanding very quickly changing needs as well. So, um, as I said, that sort of work that we've been doing in, in UK government has been picked up and adopted in, in lots of places. And one place that there's a lot of interest is in the international development world. So last year we were commissioned as Public Digital as a consultancy to, to do some research on how governments can set themselves up for success with open source. Uh, that manifested in this report, uh, which you can find uh, on our website, uh, public.digital slash research. Um, and we pulled out four areas that are vital to focus on. So getting the right policy environment, understanding the mix of skills and capabilities that you need, changing how you work with your vendors, and think about the sustainability of what you work with. Uh, I'm not gonna go into lots of detail about that, other than to say the report's very much focused on use in governments. But as we've tested that with more and more organizations, we found that they found it very useful, um, whether that's in a, a, in a bank, um, in a, a development institution in a government department uh, all over the place. Um, so hopefully it can be useful to some of you as well. And so real whistle stop tour. I often spend sort of three hours telling the, the story of gov.uk. It's, it's hard to know which bits to pull out for a sort of shorter session. Um, if there's one thing that I learned from that journey, it's that when we do the hard work to make it make things simple, and in a technology context, that means to make sure that we can make use of the things that are already available to us off the shelf um, and, and to bring teams together to focus on real problems. We can equip our organizations to do so much more than the models that came before us. Uh, in, in the UK, that's led to significantly changed um, public service delivery and, and vast savings. Uh, in many other organizations, it's helping to get things to get things to market much more quickly. Uh, to test more rapidly and to, to change millions of people's lives. So that's me. Um, very happy to take any questions. Thank you for having me. So I could just jump in with Patrick's question. Um, uh, any resistance to, to using open source software working in the open? Um, up front, there wasn't uh, all that much resistance. Uh, and I think that there were a couple of reasons for that. Um, one was that we had very good um, political support. Um, so, so Francis Maud, who I mentioned, uh, was the, the minister responsible. And he uh, took an, an unusually confident approach for a politician uh, in saying that as long as he understood what we were doing uh, and had given us enough context in sort of what was going to be important to talk about, what's, what to be careful about, um, that he was okay with us just getting out there and talking. Um, but most of the time we took a um, better to seek forgiveness than ask permission approach to things. So um, we set up a blog because that's what you do if you're making things on the internet, certainly in 2011, maybe now it's more about social media profiles. Um, we put code um, up on, on GitHub because that was the tooling that made sense to us. And we made it open because why wouldn't we? Um, and we always knew that we weren't taking huge risks in doing that, um, that we weren't putting like super sensitive things into that code and we were um, being very measured in what we said and that we could respond if we made a mistake very quickly. Um, but by putting those things out in public, we got a lot of, kind of positive affirmation. We got people saying, this is refreshingly different. This is exciting. And, and that reflected back on people who might have objected to what we were doing. Uh, later on, we started to get a bit more, a uh, bit more challenge as what we were doing scaled up. And you started to see it more in, in other parts of government uh, where 
to say when we, we built the system to allow you to register to vote online, there was a lot more nervousness about that, understandably, because the things people could do if they could mess with that service are, are, are serious. Um, but by that point, we'd developed uh, both a lot of credibility that we knew what we were doing and also some sophistication in how we thought about, about risk management around it, um, such that we were able to keep going. Uh, and we actually, in the, I mentioned briefly, there was a standard that we, we published off the back of the manual that we wrote, um, that, that we put into that a requirement that all new code that was produced for government services should be released um, publicly and under an open source license, which most of the teams coming through the assessment process did to some extent. It wasn't a sort of complete um, success, uh, but it completely changed the expectations.